chief participation. It, it is the participation of citizens that enable a robust democracy, one that is fair and attend to the needs of people. And uh, we see the emerging democracies across the continent. Some doing okay, some not doing okay, and some we see people coming in with a democratic spirit, and before we know it, they turn into tyrants and dictators. You know, we have the, the Central African region as an example where we have despots, whether it be Museveni, Gurunziza, you know, Kabila, or our beloved uh, Kagame. You know, I don't know what is wrong at that, that region. Maybe uh, you might need to go and do some exorcism there. <laughs> because that region is unique. But uh, today we are focusing on Liberia with that in mind. Liberia is Africa's oldest modern democracy. Uh, in the sense that, you know, with the, the emergence of democracy, one of those countries that was not colonized, per se, you know. But it, it has gone through transitions in so many ways. And we know the conflict, you know, the civil war and all of that. But Liberia succeeded in doing something uh, within that. That at, uh, after the civil war ended, we had three successive uh, democratic presidential transitions, you know, which is a great thing. And so we'd like to hear uh, some about that today. And we, we are trying to see how did the Liberians, given this uh, context, how did they manage to do that? Uh, what are some of the challenges? How are citizens uh, participating in this process? We also realize that uh, in this new era, since uh, after the Civil War, there are uh, new players coming on the platform. The president is what the current president is one of them. You know, so people who were hit at to quote excluded are now making their way into the public square. What is that? What triggered it? Uh, so, with that, uh, let me turn it over to Mr. Ponti first. You didn't tell us who you are. Oh, uh, <laughs> you are to who you were. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm Aniendi Okure. Uh, I'm the executive director of the African Faith and Justice Network and a fellow at the Institute for Policy Research here at Catholic University. And I'm a Dominican priest. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, first of all, Okure, uh, for your nice introduction. Um, as, the, as Father rightly said, um, as a graduate student, first of all, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to be welcome here. This is my home, Africa Faith and Justice Network. As a graduate student, I work with uh, the late Father Thomas Hayden uh, in the Africa Faith and Justice Network, uh, along with Sister Maura Brown. Um, so uh, I feel welcome. Uh, today, I am the uh, director of uh, the Father Thomas Hayden Scholarship for university students in Liberia. Uh, you can see that the work that he did is still with us. Uh, I also really want to thank uh, Brother uh, Alvito and Brother Tim Siklo uh, for really making, making it possible for me to be here. Uh, they pushed very hard. It's not easy to get us to come out to speak to people from the Voice of America. Uh, I know the last time you tried, uh, Brother told that was last year, Independence Day, you wanted me to go and speak in New Jersey, but the, our ethics uh, office turned it down because of the topic of discussion. This time, uh, and even though the um, invitation came late, we went through the chain of uh, authorization and uh, able to uh, my participation here today was uh, approved. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Brother Toe and Brother Siklo, for the, your involvement. Um, before, before I uh, make my presentation, I put together a short presentation, which I think I should do to give everybody the background in terms of where things are right now in Liberia. Um, I, before I do that, I just want to say that, although I work for the Voice of America, um, and I'm authorized to come in and participate. 
uh, comments that I make here are strictly going to be mine. I do not attribute them to the Voice of America. So um, I want to say that so that people don't say, according to Voice of America. Please say according to James Button. <laughs> we will uh, tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as I said, I put together a short presentation. Um, um, I, the, what I put together goes like this, an overview of the current political and economic uh, situation, the landscape in Liberia. And second, I'll do a brief description of the various political and civil society actors and the level of their participation in the governance of Liberia. Uh, again, this is a short time. I just put it together very quickly. Hopefully it can give us the, the way forward uh, for discussion. Uh, start with uh, the overview on the political side. Uh, President George Weah and his Congress for Democratic Change Government have only been in power for, let's say, seven months now. But uh, if you talk to Liberians, these seven months have been difficult for many, many Liberians, particularly on the economic front. The government admits that the country is going through some rough economic challenges. Uh, just last week, I was talking to, on the Independence Day of Liberia, speaking to the Deputy Minister for Information for Public Affairs, um, Eugene Pango. Uh, and uh, he told me that uh, the WIA government inherited a broke government. That's the line they would give you when you talked about what's going on. Um, I see two contradictions um, as Liberians try to assess the uh, current situation of this new government. Um, and the way I will put them, the way they, I think they are being explained, one is that of the example of the pregnant woman that was given recently by the Vice President of Liberia, Jua Hawa Taylor. And the other explanation is that of the woman with 50 children. Please don't ask me why it's, uh, yeah, everything has to do with women. But, uh, <laughs> The woman with 50 children. I will come back to these uh, two examples or these two analogies later in the presentation. The economy, the WIA government has announced a pro-poor development agenda. Pro-poor. Um, it wants to be the first government to build a rose network that will connect Monrovia to the rest of the country which uh, some people think is a noble idea, because those of you who know Liberia, and right now it's rainy season, and uh, getting access to the interior of the country is very, very difficult. So some people say, well, maybe that would be a very good idea. And so during a groundbreaking ceremony uh, for an expansion of uh, a road between ELWA and the Coca-Cola factory, the president himself said he described himself as the bridge that will connect Liberia and Liberians. That's what he put. But first, we have said that uh, the country was broke. So how do you do all this when you are broke? Uh, so the government has been trying to acquire loans. Uh, it announced this month it had entered into a US $1 billion uh, loan agreement with the World Bank um, to meet its priority, meaning finance the priorities that is on road, road construction and other development infrastructure. The Minister of Information, uh, Len Eugene Namwe, told a journalist this uh, on August 2nd that the World Bank has already made available $500 million of the $1 billion loan. Uh, of course, the interest rate there will be about 0.5%. Uh, the government had previously entered into another loan agreement with Eton and the EBOMDMAF under, also worth close to a $1 billion. Uh, with the announcement of the World Bank loan, it's not clear what has become of the, this previous loan that I just mentioned. Uh, some people say the 
the that loan was too controversial and were coming from uh, some shady groups. Uh, so uh, perhaps maybe the government got criticized for this loan, the origin of this loan, and they dropped it. Uh, and the economic hardships. Liberia is experiencing a serious economic downturn as reflected in the impact that it is having on the daily lives of the ordinary people. The prices for basic commodities uh, are the record high as uh, the Liberian dollar has fallen dramatically to the U.S. dollar. The exchange rate is 150 Liberian dollars to one U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. and the fluctuation continues. Meaning, it depends who you are talking to today. If you go to change money in the street, it will be higher. So, uh, so the cost, the cost of, because I do talk to people in Monrovia, uh, in Liberia, so I was talking to people uh, late last week and maybe earlier uh, this week, and the cost of uh, the cup of rice, uh, and depending on the quality of the rice, has gone from 20 Liberian dollars to 35, but it could be higher. This is just uh, uh, a conservative uh, figure. Transportation costs has also risen dramatically. The price of a gallon of gasoline is now 500 Liberian dollars. This after the government intervened to try to cut prices. Uh, as a result, fares to various parts of Morovia and the and its environs have uh, risen also dramatically. I was speaking to my stringer in Morovia who lived yesterday. He was telling me, oh, Mr. Party, can I work on the challenges that people face just to get transportation? I said, yes, please go ahead. Uh, so go to the different transportation centers where people get transport to go to the different places and talk to them to find out what their problems are. Uh, uh, a friend told me last week that as a family of two, he and his wife used to spend 500 Liberian dollars to cook a meal. Today, that same family spends about a thousand Liberian dollars just to cook a meal. So he asked me, Mr. Butte, imagine the cost for a family of five, uh, which is probably the norm for most Liberian given our, uh, our extended family situation. Uh, President George Weir has appealed to Liberians uh, to be to have faith, to be, to, to be patient. Uh, and he was speaking at the intercessory service for Liberia's 171st uh, prayer service, uh, uh, and he just made his appeal to the people to just, you know, give him a chance. Participation. Human rights activists are fully Franklin, Armin, Harris. I talk to these guys all the time. But Morovia told me, um, just last week that direct participation by citizens in their government in their government is becoming a partisan thing. That means people are being judged now whether you are a supporter of the government power or you are against them. That's the way they're seeing it. If you don't support the government, then you are seen as being against the government. He said opposition supporters are targeted and gradually being removed at civil service level. He also says some citizens are being threatened by senior CDC. The, the CDC is the government, the party that is in power called Congress for Democratic Change. So their officials are threatening some, their opposition. They are asking them to join the party or risk being marginalized. Now, political, political participation. There are three political parties that have come together recently. I think they it was the fifth month of the We Are Government Power that these three political parties, Unity Party, Liberty Party, and the Alternative Congress Party came together to form a collaboration to uh, be uh, the loyal opposition to the government. And this is, they are led mostly by uh, Alexander Cummings of the Alternative National Congress. Uh, 
although the, their formation came six months after the government came to power, they have been the leading opposition so far. On the civil society front, I mentioned already my friend here, uh, Fulby Henry. He has the, uh, uh, first you have Adama Dempster, uh, he has the Civil Society Human Rights Advocates and Platform of Liberia. They are the one trying to push for the establishment of a war crimes court. The Civil Society Human Rights Advocates Platform of Liberia. They are pushing for the establishment of a uh, human rights uh, a war crimes court and the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Recommendations. Uh, Fubi Henry, I already mentioned, he's an activist and he's also trying to push for war and economic crimes commission. The traditional leaders in Liberia, normally they have the voice, they speak out, but uh, they have not been speaking out lately, strongly. Uh, I guess, and uh, like most other Liberians, they are still uh, willing to give the government uh, a great deal so to deliver on its promises. You have the Union of Liberian Associations, that's the umbrella organization of Liberians here in, like, in the United States and Canada. Uh, the president was, in fact, he called me because he wanted me to do an interview with him uh, two days ago to say that uh, they are involved in trying to get uh, the government or the legislature to pass. Uh, uh, what they call a dual citizenship. Dual citizenship, that means if you're from Liberia and you live in the United States, or those who are already a U.S. citizen and still be a Liberian citizen, uh, they see some economic benefit in that, although the people in Liberia see it the other way. So they are trying to go a little softly, not to push too hard, because people in Liberia see people here as, oh, if you give those guys citizenship, they are going to come here just to take our jobs. So there's a conflict between the people in Liberia and the Liberians here, some of whom have uh, permanent residency or like US citizenship. So in fact, uh, the Liberian legislature, the, the House of Representatives, I think on Monday, they are supposed to begin debate, debate, a debate on this, a consideration of this proposal whether to make, uh, to give dual citizenship. So that's why the president of this organization called me and wanted me to do an interview with him so that I will run it on Monday morning so people in Africa can hear or in Liberia can hear them. The church, the church, and when I say the church, I mean the Catholic church, yeah? um, has been quiet, kind of. The church has been quiet, kind of, uh, over the years. This has left some people to kind of ask the question, what would the late Archbishop Michael Francis say or do today? The late Archbishop Michael Francis was uh, um, regarded as the conscience of, his, of Liberia. Uh, he spoke truth to power against corruption and human rights abuses. So people have, for some time, looked to the church to speak out whenever they see injustices going on. That was the work of Archbishop Michael Francis. As uh, Father Okuru mentioned, he passed away in 2014. Uh, so I spoke to, I was when Brother Buto and Brother Ciclo asked me, and they explained the situation. Um, uh, to come for me to come and speak, uh, and I said okay. So I wanted to know what's the problem that they uh, so uh, A friend of mine closer to the Catholic Bishops Conference uh, told me because I wanted to find out what's going on. I told me that uh, he thought, oh maybe the church or the church or the bishops or the priests don't want to be speaking individually. They would rather speak with one voice and putting our pastoral letter or doing something. But Bishop, uh, Archbishop Michael Francis' pastoral letters were regular. 
He didn't wait for a year before to put it out. He was putting them out as he saw things were running, going in Liberia. He was putting out letters. 